So now we're going to get into details of how that actually works. So virtual memory is, is not a new idea. It goes back to the 60s. This is how it was done in Multics. We have lots of different ways of accessing memory. We have these special registers that are the argument pointer and the base pointer. And what we need to understand is how, when you have an address in an executing program, how does that map to some physical location? That's what virtual memory is supposed to be giving us. Here's how addresses are in Multics. We have 36 bits total. They're divided into a segment number and a word number. That gives us an address space where we've got two of the 18 different segments and with the, within those two of the 18 different words. The way that mapping happens is from this. So here's an instruction. We've got an addressing mode that's two bits that picks one of these things. So it can either be going off the stack, we can be going off the base pointer, we can be going off these other pointers. But these are pretty similar to what you think of today as addresses relative to a base pointer or a stack pointer. Now we've got an address. It's going to turn into this generalized address. This is this 36-bit address that's used to access physical locations in memory. And it's made of these two parts. The segment number, which comes from the segment tag through the space register, and then within that segment, which word in the segment. How do we get virtual memory from this? How do we prevent any program from accessing any location in memory? What part of this should be protected by the kernel? Yes. Right. So the way this worked is what's in the space register? Right. What controls the segment number? The only programs that can set that have to be running in ring zero. So the supervisor can run an instruction that will change the segment number. A program at higher than ring zero cannot do that. So a user level program can't change the segment number. And so it can only see locations that it gets by changing the word number. It can't see all of memory. If that's how we isolate programs, what does the kernel need to do to switch processes? The scheduler ran. It said, now it's time to run some new process, switch to some new process. What does the kernel have to do? OK, yes. Yeah, exactly. Right. So all the process has to do is to change the segment number that's in this descriptor-based register. That's, in fact, exactly what it says. Switching from one process to another is just changing this descriptor base, changing the segment value that all memory locations the program can read is relative to. So that was Multics. That was back in the 60s. Let's jump ahead to 1982. And I have this nice quote, Popular Mechanics Review, of computers available in 1982, like the Apple II that's here. They're bemoaning the emergence of copy protection, which from about 1982 till about 2000 made it so it was a lot harder to see programs. And then JavaScript took over, and now you can see almost everyone's program because they run in your web browser. There's been a, a trend back and forth to how easy it is to actually see the code for programs you're running. But 1982 was kind of a low point. Did the computers? that Popular Mechanics was talking about in 1982. Did they have virtual memory? So these were their early IBM PCs that were running x86, Apple II. Did any of these computers have virtual memory? Um, it's correct that they didn't. And the, the real reason they didn't, so, so it's not true that they couldn't have more than one process running. They did not support multiple processes in the convenient way we think of a modern operating system. But you could run background processes, even on you know, old IBM PCs. You could run background processes. But they didn't have memory isolation, partly because they, you know, they were designed to be cheap, inexpensive hardware. The x86 processor did not have virtual memory until the 286 came out shortly after 1982. Providing virtual memory in a processor is pretty expensive. Multics certainly needed it. So Multics was focused on security. They did have a notion of having multiple users running multiple programs on the same machine at the same time, and were you know, developing it with a lot of military funding and, and for use in the military, so did care about security. For a single user machine that was mostly for hobbyists running games, it was less necessary and wasn't worth the cost until after about the mid-80s. 